Welcome back to the Coding Circus. Today we are going to look at how to control some of our objects and avatars that we put into our world using a set listing of coordinates and have our objects travel from one point to another point to another point. This can be really useful because Python and Wizard have done a lot of the work for those transitions from point to point to point for us. So it, it adds in some animation features that we would not normally get if we just used the traditional Viz Act and have it move from position to position to position and just add the action over and over and over again. So let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at what we're calling paths. So I've added in some code already just to do our um, setting up of our program. And I've imported in this new thing called VizTask. And that's a new class that we'll be using. I'm going to add a couple things. I'm going to add in a beach ball and a box. So there we go. We added in a beach ball, a position, add in a box with a random color. I like random colors. And now let's talk about a path. So the first thing to do to add a path is you have to call this method viz.animatedPath. And we're going to assign that to path. And then we're going to add in our control points. And these are the points that the object will follow in the path. And the nice thing about the control points here is that the computer is going to fill in all of the in-between frames for our object. And what I mean by that is it, it, this takes three different, um, excuse me, four different arguments. The first one is the time, uh, the timestamp, where they are in the path, uh, a position, an angle at which it's at, and a scale. For the second control point, we're going to do a new position, a different angle, and a different scale. So it's going to fill in all of the frames in between those two positions for us automatically. I can also set a loop mode for my path and have it loop back and forth in that path. And I'm going to set it up so it's a swing, so it kind of looks like it bounces back and forth as opposed to a circle. And then the next thing I have to do is I have to link the path to the object that I want to follow that path. If I don't link the two, then it will not follow that path. So now we're locking the box into following that path. And finally, we have to tell uh, Wizard and Python that we want to play that path. So let's take a look at that. We've set up our path, we've added our control points, we've set up the way we want it to happen, we've set up our link, and finally we're going to play the path. So let's take a look and see what it looks like. Make this bigger. And we can see the box is now following that path, but it's turning. And it's filling in all the keyframes in between for us, which is really, really useful. Let's take a look at some other paths in here. Another way of setting up a path is using a listing of control points. So I've set up this two-dimensional array of a list within a list. And each of these individual lists are coordinates that we're going to use, positions that we're going to use to follow our path. And they kind of take on like a circle kind of shape, uh, four different points. And I'm going to store that in my positions array. But since it's an array, I have to go through my different values one at a time. And I also want to keep track of which value I'm on because I'm going to have to add in that timestamp, which is kind of like an order. If I change the order, uh, it won't go this one, this one, this one, and this one. It could kind of bounce around and go through different orders, which might be cool. You can make it, be, make it do a figure eight. But if I wanted to follow this particular order, I have to set that up in my positions, which means I have to keep track of not only where I am inside my list, but also 
what index I'm at. So let's look at two different kinds of ways of doing that. Um, suppose I wanted to traverse through a my positions and just store those for right now. Let's say we have some object called B and we're going to set the positions. If I wanted to keep track of the X coordinate, in other words, which index I'm on, I'd have to do something like this where I say X equals X plus one and then print X. Or maybe I would use that inside my set positions command. And I would keep track of the index that I'm on. This looks messy uh, and it's not the way that Python Python programmers do it. What they do is they use a totally different for loop structure here. And in this structure, we're going to use something called enumerate. And Python has the ability to not only tra traverse through our list, but it also has the ability to count off which item I'm at. So I can start at 4x comma POS. So I'm keeping track of two variables at the same time, as opposed to just keeping track of one variable. And I'm going to use that enumerate command, and I'm going to still be able to set the position. Oops, and this should say POS. And then I'm just going to print X. And Python is going to count for me automatically because I'm using this enumerate command. So we're going to leverage that enumerate command and use that to set our timestamp for our position. So let's go ahead and take a look at doing that. So I'm going to enumerate count using X and set my positions to position. I'm going to set up at each of the control points. I'm going to add in a sphere. So kind of like I can see the control points that it's following through. And I'm going to just set them all to yellow. And I'm going to set their alpha to point 2, which means they're faded, these faded control points. So they're, they're visible, but they're barely visible. And then I'm also, while I'm at it, in the same loop, I'm going to set the control point uh, starting at 1. This is going to count starting at 0. I'm going to start at 1 by adding 1 and set the position to be the current position in the list. So I'm adding my control points to my path one at a time using this uh, really nifty for loop, which also keeps track of the x value. Okay, next I'm going to set my loop mode to circular, so that way it kind of follows the path in a circle. And I'm going to do two things together. These two things mean that the ball will actually turn to follow our control path. Like imagine you were flying an airplane and you would want it to follow a path. You would have the airplane kind of turn and dive and bank to follow along that path as opposed to just sitting still oriented in one direction and just kind of moving around the path. We definitely want it turning and looking like it's following that path. Again, this is the power of using the paths. Um, it allows us to do that. If we didn't use the path and just did the move to, it would just kind of slide along. And we'd have to control the Euler angles ourselves, which could be complicated. So this is really, really nice. We're going to set up our link between our path and our ball, our beach ball. And then finally, we got to play it. So I'm going to play my link. Now, the default mode for this is linear, which means it's going to go from point to point to point if we watch our beach ball. It just kind of does a, a straight turn. And it goes from point to point. And you can notice that the yellow stripe is always facing the direction of motion, which is great. But it kind of looks a little rigid in the way it moves. So we can control that movement by adding in another parameter. And what we're going to do is call path 2, because we're affecting path 2, and I'm going to set the translate mode. And right now, the default is linear. I'm going to set it to something called cubic Beezer. And it's named after the person who created the math to make that happen. But for us, the real important thing is 
when we now fly through, our ball now looks like it's taking an arc path. And it's much smoother as it goes through each of those yellow control points. I think it just looks really, really cool. It looks like it's really flying. OK. Let's set up um, another ball. Uh, give it a color. I'm using the color 2, so it could be a separate random choice. Adding our sphere and adding our collide mesh. And the reason why I want to add this other ball is suppose I want to keep track of um, some events. right? I want um, different events to occur, and I want to know what happens when this ball, or actually, you know, another, well, let's add actually an animation path to this. So we can kind of have it follow a particular animation path. And we're just going to use the same animation path we did for the box, just kind of have it bounce back and forth. And, but I want to know when certain things happen for this ball. So I can add in events. And there are four different path events that are built into Vizard. So let's look at those four different path events. The first one is an add event at end. And I'm going to call it its beach ball end. So when the beach ball reaches the end, we're going to Throw up a flag and say this event occurred. Now we have to handle those flags. We're going to look at that in a minute. I can add an event after a certain amount of time. Time equals 2. And this is the message that comes across. Beach ball end, beach ball time equals 2. And this is the amount of time. So I want to make sure that's clear. This is a message that's occurring on the screen. I could just say has reached end. I'd say whatever I want. Um, a distance, when the beach ball has reached a distance, 7 in this case. And when it has reached a particular control point. So I can say when it has reached point 1, um, and the control point I'm looking at is 1, which is, again, that index that we talked about. That was very important, having that index in our loop. So now we have these events that are built in, but we've got to handle those different events. So let's talk about some ways of handling events. Option 1 is to handle the events kind of all at one time. Any time any one of these events are triggered, and we call that a viz path event, and we're using our callback feature. Remember we use callback for on grab, um, and on release, and on collide. So now we're using on path event. So when any of those events occur, I'm going to call this method, and it's going to print the object that it occurred. It's going to say the event was triggered, and then it's going to give you the event name, which is the text that I put in each one of these um, event methods. So let's go ahead and see how that works. So we can see the beach ball each time one of those events occurs we get a message in our inspect interactive window. Each ball has reached its end, point 0.1, distance 7, time equals 2. And then it just loops back around because the beach ball is following that path for us. So that's option 1 for handling that event. And I'm going to just disable that by commenting out the callback event. And now it won't happen. Let's look at option 2. Option 2, we have the ability to handle the events independently. So suppose we're looking at our box, and we just want to see when the box, that's why we're using path, because path is linked to the box, has reached the end. So when the box has reached the end, we're going to print box has reached the end of the path. And again, we're going to use another event handler. It's called on path event. It's different than the callback. And we're going to list the path that we're listening to. And when it has reached end, we should call on path end. That's the name of the method. So this is a second way of handling that. So let's take a look and see how that works. So we can see our box moving back and forth. And every time it reaches the end of that path, it says the box has reached the end. So all the other events um, are not being triggered. 
We're just listening for when the box has reached the end of the path. Okay. And we're going to comment that one out for now. We'll come back and let them all run later. And finally, the last path is the, the way, the last way of handling it is the way I like the best. It's called a task. We've looked at tasks before. So I've defined a method called play path task. Uh, and I'm going to have it move um, this ball. As soon as the task is scheduled, it's going to start moving path three, which is um, this ball that I added in here, right? Path three, set loop mode, swing, okay? So that's that ball that we added. And it's going to be in a forever loop, and it's every time it reaches the end, it's going to say ball path finish playing. Remember, it's going to wait. This yield says wait until it has reached the end, and then say this message, and then we're going to go back up to the top, and we're going to wait again. So I, I like the task because it kind of fits in nicely with everything else. Um, all the other tasks we've done, and we're going to schedule the task, play, path, task. And you could even make um, other events schedule that task. Maybe the task doesn't start playing until something else occurs. So you could take this viz.schedule and put this inside of some other task or some other event that's occurring. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. And we can see now the ball has finished playing the task each time it gets all the way to the left. Okay, so you know, let's try that just for fun. I'm just going to take this, this task scheduler, and I am going to put it in here. So it won't start moving until the box has moved through once, right? It's going to schedule that task after the box has moved through one time. So let's go ahead and take a look at that. So it's going to start out and the ball's going to be sitting still. Box gets to the end and now the ball starts moving. But isn't that cool now? They're now moving at opposites because the ball waited for the box to get to the end first before it standard started moving. So we can combine events and tasks together and kind of get some really cool looking animations in here on our screen. I think that looks great. Reminds me of maybe doing like a solar system or something like that, where they're all dependent upon each other. OK, so that is all I have for you today. We're going to be doing more with our animated avatars shortly and adding in our paths for them and having them move around and walk around the screen. That's going to be a whole lot of fun, I think. I'll see you next time.